Well, greetings, saints. Welcome to Chaplain Peter One on YouTube. I'm also on brighteon.com under Heavenly Glory. And my website is eternalvaluesministries.com. You can also find me on LinkedIn and Facebook under Chaplain Peter One or Eternal Values Ministries. Okay, Romans chapter 5, 1. We continue our, our uh, lesson going through the book of uh, Romans. Last time in uh, Romans uh, 4, we saw that um, Abraham was uh, justified by faith. The imputed righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ was given to Abraham for simply believing. Simply believing. Amen? And it tells us here in Romans uh, chapter 4, in verse 21, and being fully persuaded that what God had promised, he was also able to perform. The Lord told Abraham, you're going to be the father of many nations. And he's already um, uh, almost 100 years old or so. <laughs> and his wife is beyond child bearing age. And now, now God's going to do a miracle to show us that this isn't just uh, Abraham doing this, but this was the Lord God doing this. And it says, therefore, it was imputed, put to his account, financial term, a legal term, imputed to him for righteousness. Well, whose righteousness? Jesus' righteousness. Now, it was not written for his sake alone that it was imputed to him, but for us also to whom it shall be imputed if we believe on him that raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was delivered for our offenses and was raised again for our justification. So then we go into Romans um, chapter uh, 5. And in verse 1, the results of justification. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. So Paul concludes, he says, therefore, after what I just read, what happened with Abraham, being justified by faith, declared righteous by faith, faith, trust, simply believing in what God says, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. This, this peace here, is having peace through the blood of his cross, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances which was against us, as Colossians says. So we have peace. We're not no more at enmity. We're not enemies of God. We have the peace of God that passes all understanding. And if you're a believer and you don't have this, you, you can have peace. What is the uh, fruits of the Spirit? Love, joy, peace, long-suffering. You can have the peace of God that passes all understanding. In other words, it's better than trying to figure everything out. God gives us faith. Uh, and this faith that we have to believe in Jesus is a reasonable faith. It's not how some people portray it that somehow it's a leap into the unknown, into fanaticism, into some cult or something. No. We have a reasonable faith, a very reasonable, very logical faith based on the uh, scriptures. And by the way, um, has anybody ever disproved the Bible to be wrong? The first coming of the Lord Jesus Christ has something like 350 prophecies of him coming the first time. All kinds of different prophecies. 
none of them has ever failed. They've been all fulfilled. And there's a lot more coming about his, about the second coming when he comes a second time to judge the world. And so, like I said, we have a very reasonable faith. And we have this faith. We access this through faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, verse 2. By whom also we have access. We have an act. We got it. We got a path, an access, an open door by faith into this grace wherein we stand. We stand sure. We stand like like pillars. Amen. We're not we're not wobbling back and forth, and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Let's look at this word hope in the concordance here <clears throat> and let's see what we get okay total times is used in the King James is 54 times and it's used 53 times as hope and faith as one time um, the outline of biblical usage, expectation of evil, fear. <laughs> okay, it can be used in a negative sense of um, expecting evil or fear. I never really heard people say, I hope sure, I hope evil comes and fear comes, but it can be used in that sense. Expectation of good, hope, praise the Lord. In the Christian sense, joyful and confident expectation of eternal salvation in hope. Having hope. The author of hope. Of who is his foundation? The thing hoped for. We can um, look at some uh, scriptures here. This hope is um, a sure hope. It's not like, well, I sure hope I'm going to make it to heaven. Well, that's the kind of hope I would have if I relied on myself to get to heaven. In fact, it'd be the negative hope of fear and judgment. But because Jesus did it, he paid the price, and he imputes to me his righteousness by me believing in the gospel that he died for me and rose from the dead. Um because he did it. I have it. It's a simple, and it's sure. It's a sure hope. Here it says in Romans 8, 24, we are saved by hope. But a hope that is seen is not hope. For what a man see it, why does he yet hope for? This is uh, in context with we know not what we pray for, but the Holy Spirit make an intercession for us, which words that can't be uttered. And then he goes on to saying, we know all things work together for good to them that trust in God, to them that love God and trust in him. And so we are saved by hope. Now, we are saved by grace through faith. Amen. The substance of things hoped for. So faith brings us into, a, into, into reality, the sure hope that we have in Christ. He says in 2 Corinthians 1, 7, And our hope of you is steadfast, knowing that as you are partakers of the sufferings, so you shall also be of the consolation. Praise the Lord. Um. And now abided faith, hope, and charity. God's our love. These three, but the greatest of these is charity. In, in uh, Titus 1, 2, in hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began. Amen. So we have a great hope. Titus 3, 7, that being justified by his grace, we should be made heirs according to the hope of 
eternal life. So how's your hope today? Do you got hope? You, you need to. Because it's, it's the Lord Jesus Christ who has done everything. And our hope is a sure hope. Hebrews. So you can rest assured and stand fast. In this grace we have, we access it by faith. And we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Romans 5, 3, and not only so, but we also glory in tribulations and troubles and problems, afflictions, persecutions, and tribulations also. Knowing that tribulation worketh patience and patience experience and experience hope and hope make it not ashamed because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. Amen. So let's look at this. These, these uh, verses combined together. Okay. And so we have this hope. We stand in, we access it by faith, by grace and faith. And we rejoice in his hope. And we also glory in the troubles we go through. I couldn't imagine being in, in this sinful state that I am in, and all of us are in, since the fall of Adam. All have sinned, come short of the glory of God. We're born with our fist in God's face. And as we get older even as children it starts showing in disobedience to parents and then it gets worse you know uh, unless we uh we get a hold of the lord and so if there was no suffering no no troubles no problems and we were and we and we are these great sinners i mean my goodness what kind of a a life would that be You'd be doing all kinds of evil things and there'd be no troubles, no problems, nothing. You know, just because uh, bad things happen to good people doesn't mean that, um, that God is against us. But he's got a purpose and a plan going through these uh, troubles, these tribulations we have. And so... We glory in tribulations. I think that's one of the things about this dispensation of uh, grace. Let's 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 go for a moment to Second Corinthians, chapter twelve, and let's look at Paul rejoicing in this grace. Second Corinthians, chapter twelve. And Paul says here, it is expedient for me, doubtless to glory, I will come to visions and revelations of the Lord. He says, I knew a man in Christ about 14 years ago, whether in the body, I cannot tell, whether out of the body. You don't know if he was dead or alive. He had this uh, vision. I cannot tell, God knows. Such a one was caught up to the third heaven. So I don't believe he went up there bodily. Um, I'm not sure if this could be in Acts 14 when he was stoned in Iconium and they left him for dead and then the uh, apostles or some uh, people came, disciples, and he rose up and he went back into town. This might have been at that time. We don't, I don't really know. But um he was beaten so many times and uh and apparently here he doesn't know if he's dead or alive and he's caught up to the third heaven the first heaven is the atmosphere around the earth where we are second heaven is out of space 
where the principalities, powers, thrones, and dominions, the devil and his fallen angels are. They can come back and forth. And, and Paul says in verse 3, And I knew such a man, whether in the body or out of body, I don't know. Verse 4, How that he was caught up into paradise and heard unspeakable words, which is not lawful for a man to utter. But he says in verse 5, of such a one will I glory, yet of myself I will not glory, but in mine infirmities. That's part of the tribulations and troubles of life. Bodily sickness and weaknesses and troubles and, you know, in our bodies. So he says, of such a one will I glory, yet not of myself, yet of myself I will not glory, but in my infirmities. I think if we can get a hold of this, um, there's going to be a big change in our life. For though I would desire to glory, to brag, to boast, I shall not be a fool. For I will say the truth, but now I forbear, lest any man should think of me above that which he seeth me to be, or that he heareth of me. Uh, he did not want people to make him out to be some great one. The glory goes to God, and this is where we have to be, saints. We have to be like the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit doesn't brag or boast about himself. We don't worship the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit points to the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? And so Paul's given a thorn in the flesh. 2 Corinthians 12, 7. And lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of revelations, all these revelations, visions, the, this mystery that's given to him of the grace of God, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh. You can take like you took a rose bush, take it in, and take the thorns and press it against your ribs, a thorn in the flesh. The messenger of Satan to buffet me, to beat him about. Messenger, this word is also translated angel. In the Greek, it's angel. So a messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. And so you say, now, wait a second. What is the devil uh, doing here tormenting Paul? Well, it may be hard for some of you to receive this, but as you read through the Bible, I just got through reading in um, in 1 Samuel how Saul was envious and jealous of uh, David while Saul was king and David was um, moving up in ranks and he should become king and replace Saul. And it says the Lord sent Saul an evil spirit. The Lord sent it to him. Other times I remember, I believe, in the book of Jeremiah, where um, Jeremiah's warning um, the Jewish people, you're going into Babylonian captivity. You need to repent. This is going to happen. You're going to Babylonian captivity. Don't fight it. Go there, live there, plant your crops there. We had all these other people, these so-called prophets. No, no, no. Jeremiah don't know what he's talking about. It's not going to happen. Peace, O king. There's going to be peace. Well, God, when he saw these, these lying prophets speaking something God did not tell them to speak and lying to the king and to the people, he sent him, he sent these prophets a lying spirit. The way, here's the way it works. Um, you and me have a free will. And if God sees us going in an evil direction and he warns us and everything and, you know, sends people to us, we read things in the scriptures, we know we need to repent and we're not repenting, God will fortify that evil and make it even worse. Classical example is uh, Romans 
chapter 9 with Pharaoh. You can go back to Exodus when it says Pharaoh hardened his own heart. Let my people go. And every time he would, uh, I've sinned, I've sinned. But every time, then when it's time to let him go, and the plague ended, you know, a fake repentance, he, he wouldn't let the people go. No godly sorrow. And so God finally hardened Pharaoh's heart, judicial hardening. And so this is how God works. Remember the uh, the parable with the um, uh, the boss is going on a long journey, the master, and he um, he he gives one guy um, five um, pieces of gold, another guy he gives three of them, and another guy he gives one. And after a while, when he comes back, the guy who had five, he put it on the uh, stock market and he got uh, a return on it, you know, and, uh, and he got another five. And the Lord said, well done, good and faithful servant. You shall rule over 10 cities. And the guy who had three, he put it to usury, got some interest and got some more. And well done, you're going to rule so over some more cities. And the one that had one, he said, I know that you were a, um, a hard man. And so I took uh, the one gold piece you gave me and I buried it. And here it is. Here it is for you. He said, you lazy, no good servant, the Lord tells him. You could have done this. You couldn't have done that. So I would have had more when I come back. Take away from him what he had and give it to him that had 10. And that's a principle of God. You know, because when you when you march toward God and you live your life for the Lord and you take those steps of faith going toward, even if you were in your tribulation, like Paul was being beaten and having this thorn in the flesh, what happens is God will increase your strength. And this is what's happening here with Paul. God gives him this, this revelation and this angel, this messenger of Satan is sent to, sent to him by God, lest I should be exalted above measure. And the exaltation, I do not believe like some versions say that he was, that he should become conceited, but rather like it says in the verse right here before that, lest any man should think of me above that which he seed me to be, or hear me to be, of me, and should exalt me above measure, who's given him a thorn in the flesh. And he asked the Lord, I besought the Lord three times, thrice, that it might depart from me. Lord, and when he asked the Lord three times, um, I'm sure it was with fasting and prayer. He just, Lord, can you take this away from me? Hey, Lord, do you remember something? Can you take me? It's probably he fasted and he prayed a season. Because it was a, a bad thorn in the flesh that troubled him. And we know in Galatians chapter 6, you read the end of the chapter, and it says, Paul says, you see what a, a large letter I have wrote to you with my own hand. Well, when you look it up in the Greek, the large letter isn't a lengthy letter, letter but rather is the grammar. The letters itself were large. He has some kind of sickness with his eyes or something that made his eyes go bad. Remember, he was blinded completely for three days until uh, Ananias laid his hands on him and he got filled with the Holy Spirit. And so, and what's the answer of the Lord here? And he said unto me, my grace is sufficient. Now, like I said, we are in a time that God has dispensed his grace. My grace is is sufficient for thee for my strength is made perfect in weakness and these infirmities and troubles and tri tribulations brings this on most gladly therefore i'd rather glory in my infirmities why what does he mean that the power of christ may rest upon me there is something about when you serve the Lord and you go through troubles, problems, afflictions, sicknesses, um, even having to face death, 
that God gives you supernatural power by his Holy Spirit to continue on and to give glory to God. Remember how the apostles were beaten. Um, early Acts chapters 4 and, and 5. Uh, before, before, they were, before they received the Holy Spirit, Peter's denying the Lord three times, cursing him, cur cursing these people out that uh, saying, yeah, you got to be one of these Galilee. I never knew him and he's cursing. And um, they hid because they, the Jews were after him, you know, and, uh, you know, to take them in front of the, in front of the council and maybe put them to death and they're afraid. And all of a sudden, when they get filled with the Holy Spirit at the Pentecost, they're told to shut up, not to speak in this man's name no more. And they beat him and they go back and they tell the, uh, the, the, their families, they tell the, the disciples, we've been beaten and they all raise up their voice and praise God and that they've been worthy to be put to shame and to be beaten for Christ's sake. And straightway, they went to the temple and continued preaching. They didn't have this boldness. This is something God gives, and, it, and, and you get it through suffering and tribulations. You don't get this in the good, easy times. You get this when, when there's troubles and problems. So most gladly, therefore, I'd rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon us. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities. Sounds like a, like a madman, but... And that's what the world looks at it like. But he understands. He's got it. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, when people reproach you, come against you, in necessities, having to need, be needy, needing things, in persecutions, in distresses, not for my stupidity, my sins, but for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I'm strong. Then the strength of Christ rests upon me. Amen. And then he goes on and says how God did all kinds of miracles through him and all this. And, and he just speaks about his apostleship. But if we can grab hold of this, that we are in this grace and in this, in this grace, God has given us this uh, great mercy and this power to overcome, and, and here he lays it out for us. Knowing that tribulation, work it. It's working this in you. Patience. Patience. And meant to be able to deal with things in uh, patience and long suffering, in not, um, not fainting, but continuing on, having having patience, because the Lord gives you this patience. And this patience gives you what? Experience and how to deal with all these these troubles and problems. See, because if you just have no self-control and you fly off the handle, you're not going to gain experience and how to deal with things. So you have to have the, this patience and wait on the Lord, and experience will come to you on how to overcome things. Um, it may be even things like an addiction of some sort, some kind of stronghold in your life, uh, or it could be persecution and afflictions for the gospel. But you're doing this, you, you're looking for the victory in Christ. And so you get this experience on how to handle these things. And this experience then produces this hope in you, like we read earlier, this sure hope. Amen. And verse 5, and hope make it not ashamed. Hope makes us not ashamed. Not our hope in Christ. You'll never be ashamed. You'll never be put to shame if your hope is in Christ and you hold on to it to the end. Because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. Because the love of God, this sacrificial love, this love that looks to help other people before you help yourself, the love that took Jesus to the cross when he volunteered 
to go through everything he had to go through to save you and me. The love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us who believe. Verse 6, For when we were yet without strength, in due time, at the right time, God's timing is perfect, Christ died for the ungodly. He waited till Abraham was about 100 years old before he had a son and Sarah couldn't conceive no more. His timing's fine. It's perfect. He came just at the right time to save mankind. Everything's happening in your life just at the right time if you're trusting God and walking with him. For when we were yet without strength, get this, understand this, without strength. You know, God's not interested in how much, how many push-ups you can do, how far you can run, how many weights you can lift. Amen? He's looking at this endurance, this physical strength that comes from the Lord to endure all these things. And so when we were without strength, dead in trespasses and sins, um, ready to bust hell wide open, making a mess and a wreck of our lives, while we were in that kind of condition and state, in due time, at the right time, at the perfect time, Christ died for the ungodly. Well, that's me, the ungodly. Praise God. Now I've got the righteousness of Jesus. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Yet peradventure for a good man, someone would even dare to die. So, he's saying here, people will die for certain other people. For a righteous man. But God commended, that means demonstrated, his love toward us in that while we were yet Sinners, not after you improved your life or got yourself some kind of course on positive thinking or something, <laughs> but while you were yet sinners, um, I got saved in the middle of my sins, man. It was a miracle. And that's how it is with every one of us. It's a miracle. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And this was planned and set into motion before the foundation of the world. My, what a God we have. Verse 9, much more than being now justified, declared righteous by his blood. In other words, his death on the cross, his blood shed for you and me, by his blood, not the blood of a, a goat or a bull or of a lamb on Passover, but he died at the precise time of three o'clock when he sacrificed the Passover lamb, because he is the Passover lamb, the real deal. So being declared, being justified by his blood. Do you understand? Justified, legally declared righteous. You can stand in front of a judge on this earth earth, and be found not guilty. But he can't say, okay, you're, uh, you know, you're justified. There is just, justifiable homicide, I suppose. But here we're talking about being declared righteous by God himself. I mean, what more, what more do we want? I mean, Adam didn't have this yet. He was innocent. He didn't have this. But you and me are totally justified, forgiven of all our sins. He, he's removed them as far as the east is from the west, never to be held against us again. Praise God. Man, could you imagine? How, how, could, how can you live if God would mark out our sins and hold them against us? Oh, it'd be, it wouldn't be worth living. Now, justified by his blood, 
we shall be saved from the wrath through him. Not only the wrath that's coming, which is coming, but his wrath is revealed right now. Romans chapter 1 says, For the wrath of God is revealed against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth and unrighteousness. They suppress the truth. They know it, but they suppress it. They don't want, they don't want it to get out. Bunch of devils. We shall be saved from the wrath through him. Why is that? Because Jesus took the wrath of God the Father upon himself on our behalf. Who, who preaches such a gospel? Buddha? Mohammed? Hinduism? Zor, Zoroastrianism? You know, who, who preaches such a gospel? Judaism? Well, they were the closest because at least they had forgiveness of sins under the law when they, when they would sacrifice the animals on the Day of Atonement for a year. And so verse 10, for if when we were enemies, enemies, let that sink in, enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. Let's look at this uh, reconciled here. Let's go to cross-references. To receive one into favor. Now, I want to see a particular verse in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Here we are. He says here, let me see, verse... 18, 2 Corinthians 5, 18. And all things are of God who has reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. To wit, to witness that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself. The world unto himself not imputing, not counting their sins, not counting their trespasses onto them, and had committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Do, do you understand what this is saying? It's saying that the whole world, everybody that's ever lived, could, could be saved if they would believe the gospel. Now, Noah believed what God told him to build an ark, and he did it. Abraham believed what God said, and, he, and God gave him the power and the strength to do it. It was imputed to him for righteousness. And the same is for us to believe Jesus died for our sins and rose from the dead. But this is for the world. In other words, um, man's, man is not barred from going to heaven uh, because of his sin, but because he's rejecting the Lord Jesus Christ. This is the reason. Because Jesus has paid for the sins of the world. I know there's people that, Christians, that will not like this, and won't, but this is how I read it. And this is what I get out of it. And many do, and I believe this is the correct sense of the scripture. And so, Anybody in the world can be saved because the sin is not the issue no more. Now, if you die in your sins, it's going to be a very big issue. You die in your sins, you're going to, you're going to, you're going to end up in the lake of fire for eternity. But you're going to have to pay for your own sin. The wages of sin is death, and the gift of God is eternal life through our Lord Jesus Christ. Romans 6.23 and, you know, as by one man sin entered in the world, and death passed upon all men, for all men have sinned. And it's appointed unto a man to die once, but then comes the judgment. And without Jesus as your advocate, without him imputed his righteousness to you, you got to pay for your own sin. 
How are you going to pay it? It's not happening. And so the way's open for anybody. The curtain is torn. The veil's torn in half. Exposing the holy of holies. God's inviting us all in. And so the world, he reconciled the world unto himself. Not imputing. Holding their trespasses against them. Counting it against them. And he's committed to you and me that are saved. The word of reconciliation. And then Paul comes to a conclusion here. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ. An ambassador is someone who represents a foreign country, a nation in another in an, in a in another nation. You could be a, an ambassador to China, ambassador to to uh, Brazil, a ba- ambassador to Mexico or Canada. You have the authority of the United States backing you as an ambassador representing that nation in a foreign country. So you and me are in a foreign country. Our citizenship is in heaven. Amen? We're just passing through here. We're pilgrims. Now, some of you are pretty tightly here grabbing on to to this world. You need to let it go. God will provide for you everything. Put God first. Surrender your life to him. Okay, now then, we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead, in his place, be reconciled to God. Be reconciled to God. Now, oh, I want to go into the next two verses. Let me get there. And he says, For he... God had made him, Jesus, to be sin for us who knew no sin, the sinless Lamb of God, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. And so the the last verse we're going to look at here in verse 11. And not only so, but we also joy in God, the joy of the Lord. Amen. Love, joy, peace, long suffering, all these things. And not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received the atonement. Atonement. Being Bruce chapter 12, verse 2, he says here, Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. You know what that joy was? Dear saints, that joy is him, the Lord Jesus, saving you and me. This great joy that we are going to be with him for all eternity. Well, praise the Lord. I hope um, this Bible study has helped you. And we've got some things coming up here in... uh, in the next verses of Romans 5.12 about guilt of Adam, original sin, all kinds of things we're going to get into. I love you, saints. Walk with the Lord. Don't give up. Don't faint. Faint and know that whatever you're going through, um, with God, he'll strengthen you by his Holy Spirit and you'll even come out better than before. God bless you. I love you. And you have a good day.